I'd like now to invite you, if you would, to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. I'm going to continue the series that we have been doing on a pattern to live by daily choices. We've looked at Luke 11. There's another account of it that is recorded in Holy Scripture by Matthew and is found in the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. When a portion of Scripture like this is selected, usually there's delivery of a message or a teaching on the topic of prayer. But as all of you are aware, or if you're new with us today for the first time, we're not dealing so much with prayer, even though the choices that we make will impact our prayer life. We're talking about a pattern of how we live with the choices that we have and that we make each day. And I believe this portion of scripture gives us an insight of different choices that we should make each day. At the very inception, the very beginning of my day, I will make a series of choices because I know the choices that I make connect with the consequences that I will experience throughout the day. That every decision that I make will bear results. What I seed, I'm going to reap. And so choices are extremely important to me and the Bible teaches us that we need to be very sober and vigilant and very purposeful and tenacious and even militant when it comes to the choices that we make. Now let's read the scripture. It's found in Matthew in chapter 6 and verses 9 through 13. Here in this portion of scripture it says, Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive all those who offend us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. We had the opportunity of singing a little bit of that in the song time, the praise that we lifted to the Lord. And this passage of scripture gives us a pattern for daily choices that we would make. We talked about some of those choices. Now I want to elaborate this morning on three in particular. First, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is a daily choice that I make. I choose to be in partnership with God, to cooperate with God. Now there's a mystery. We understand, we comprehend the reality that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He's omnipresent. He's present everywhere. And he is self-sufficient. He really, technically, theologically, biblically, practically does not need me. He doesn't need you. But in the mystery of our relationship with him, he wants us and he needs us in that context. And so when it comes to our heart and our response to him, we need to have a heart of cooperation a heart of partnership. Lord, I want to see your will done. I want to see your kingdom come. I want it to manifest, become visible and apparent in my lifestyle, in my conduct, in my behavior, in the choices that I have throughout the week. I want it to be present in my marriage. I want it to be present in our singleness or with our children, grandchildren, in our sphere of influence, in the workplace, in the neighborhood, in the community in this county, in this world. I want your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the only way to birth it on earth is I have to cooperate and be in partnership with God and to recognize that in my partnership with God, then he will do incredible things in and through my life. If you think of it, Abraham had to cooperate with God when it came to the establishment of a nation. And then when you think of the various patriarchs like Moses, he had to cooperate and be in partnership with God in order to bring deliverance to a nation. You have Esther who had to be in cooperation and partnership with God in order to protect a nation from experiencing a genocide of being completely wiped out. Isaiah had to be connected and in partnership with God to prophesy those things that would come about. Paul had to be in partnership with God, cooperate with him to write a third of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and Peter in order to preach and teach, and John, the apostle, in order to see a great revelation recorded in the Bible. There was cooperation. There was partnership. 
Where is it in your life that you have to say, Lord, I want to cooperate with you. I want to be in partnership with you because I know the enemy will come and assault that and attack that. There's a Goliath that needs to go down, but you need a David to be in partnership and in covenant and in cooperation with you that he'll take a few stones, but you'll do the miracle of bringing the Goliath down. But we have to be connected to him. Can I encourage you to make a daily choice in relationship to this pattern that Jesus establishes for us to say, Lord, I choose today to be in partnership with you, to cooperate with you so that your will, your kingdom would be made visible in this world. Romans chapter 12 and verse two says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want his kingdom to come. His kingdom is the manifestation of his will. So we need to be good discerners of the will of God. And the scripture says we ought not to be conformed or transformed into this world but we need to be absolutely renewed in our mind so that we would comprehend and fully understand and fully embrace what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. When you talk about that, realize this is not really three different expressions. It's kind of three different manifestations of God's will. God's will is one composite unit, but it is expressed or manifests itself in three different ways. That which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Kind of like the Trinity. When you think of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're distinct from one another, but not separate. So it is a distinction that doesn't imply separation. So it's one. And in the same way, God's will is one, but it expresses itself as being defined as that which is good, understandable, acceptable. It's the right thing to do. And it's perfect. It needs to be completed in and through our life. I think our appropriate response to this reality is to have kind of a threefold response to God's will, that we say, Lord, I know your will, I accept your will, and I do your will. All three of those, I think, are very significant and extremely important. I have to know it. I have to understand it. This is not just cerebral or academic or intellectual. It's relational. It's personal. It's not something mechanical. But I need to understand, comprehend the will of God. And then when I have that epiphany, that enlightenment, that illumination of this is his will, then I need to accept it and embrace it. In the acceptance of it, that impacts your attitude. There are some who will know God's will and do it, but they never fully accept it. And because they don't fully accept it, their attitude has an aroma that is not pleasant. And so you have to say, Lord, I know your will, and I accept it. Be it pleasant or difficult, I accept it, and then I'm going to do it. It's going to manifest through my life. It's good, I know it. It's acceptable, I embrace it. And it's perfect, I'm gonna let it manifest through my life, be made complete, be made visible, and be seen. Now when it comes to God's will, maybe if you look at the Bible, you could understand there's different aspects of it. If we want to make sure that we express a choice to say, I wanna be in partnership with God, I wanna cooperate with God, I want his will to be done on earth, we need to know his will. Well, the best way to discover and understand the will of God is to read the Bible. Read it, study it, memorize it, personalize it, internalize it. Let it be so intrinsically a part of who you are. To me, this is not just a nice religious textbook. I've been a student, I've studied the Quran, I've read it page to page, or the Bhagavad Gita, or the Vedic writings, or the divine principle. But that is just to grow intellectually to know how to respond to those who have that type of belief system. But for me personally, when I approach the Bible, I know I am encountering the infallible, inerrant word of the living God. Hebrews 4.12 said it's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can transform your entire life. It's alive, and it has tremendous power and tremendous authority. So when I open the Bible, that is his written will, I discover exactly what God wills and what he desires and what he wants. And so I encourage you to be a good student, to be a good disciple. Know the written will of God. That makes you then a candidate 
to discover his spoken will or his will that the Holy Spirit will communicate to your heart. See, I believe when I spend time in the written voice of God, the written will of God, I become a candidate to hear his spoken will, his spoken voice to my heart. We might say, well, it's a mystery. How do you know what God sounds like? How could you possibly know what God sounds like? How can you differentiate between the voice of self or the voice of others or society or Satan? I think the more time you listen to this CD of God's written voice, his written will, you'll know exactly what he sounds like if you'll just spend time here. And so when you step away, he speaks to you with his spoken will, something that's very personal to you, that you don't have necessarily a chapter and verse on it, but you know, boy, this is God speaking to me. You know that you know that you know because you've spent time in his written will, his written voice, and you've gained a familiarity with exactly what he sounds like. When it comes to God's revealed will, it's just another way of looking at this. When you come to Holy Scripture, he reveals very clearly his direction, and it helps you then discover. That's a little bit of a process of discovering his will for your life. It may be particular situations. For example, in my own life, there might be a decision I have to make with our finances or in a relationship or something related to the church. I don't have chapter and verse on it. I know I have to discover his will regarding this matter. I'll seek the counsel and the input of others. Sure, I will. But I also know that if I do this, I go to Holy Scripture and I try to find something as closely connected to that decision as possible. And then I will look at it and say, okay, what in here must I listen to and obey? That which God has already revealed. He's already revealed something here about relationships. I'm going to make sure I'm doing it. Because when I do his revealed will, I become a candidate again to discover his will in that specific area of my life. I'll put it this way. Do what you know to do. Do what you know to do. Then you'll know what to do. Do what you know to do. Then you'll know what to do. If you walk in that heart and that spirit, believe me, God will guide you so clearly. Psalm 32, 8, I will lead you, I will guide you, I'll direct you in the way that you should go with my eye upon you. You'll know and discern my will, and then you'll let it manifest on this earth. It's very clear that which is written and already revealed, and then God will speak and cause those other things to be discovered. And as some who had mentored and discipled me, this was a component of understanding the will of God that I was a little personally resistant to because I wanted my walk with Jesus to be always happy with a big smile and never very hard or difficult. And those who mentored me said, you have to realize that the will of God in some areas of your life, Gary, will be very pleasant, and in some other areas, it will be very difficult. But you have to press on, be tenacious, and do it. When I meet with different missionaries, especially in persecuted nations, they're carrying out the will of God, and it is very difficult. Some of the areas that I'll be going to in a couple weeks, they're in Nepal and in northern India, Kashmir, very challenging areas for Christians. And I'll know I'll meet brothers and sisters that understand the cross, the self-sacrifice, the difficult will of God. And that always inspires me, never depresses me. And may your life, as you carry out not only the pleasant will of God, but the difficult will of God, let it inspire others. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we are therefore kingdom people. And I thought this would be an appropriate portion of scripture to listen to and to hear. That is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Since we're talking about God's will and his kingdom coming, Consider the fact that we are his kingdom people. And it says this, you are a chosen generation. There's a description of us. It's found in the New Testament. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, called out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God. I'd like you to think about these adjectives that are used to describe us, all right? First of all, a chosen generation. A chosen generation means you've been selected and you've been elected. 
Now think of it in our own government. We have a democracy, but technically it's a republic because it involves representation of individuals. It's not a pure democracy, it's a republic. That's why we have a, a house of representatives and a senate, that's the Congress. And we understand that that branch is established to represent us, we the people. These individuals, men and women, they were selected, they were elected, they were empowered with the power of influence now, not just for themselves, but for others. I want you to think of that. When they step into the halls of Congress, they're not just representing themselves. Sure, they're still maybe 5'6", five, 5'7", six, five, six foot tall. Maybe they weigh 170, 200, whatever. They're still the same physical structure, but their footprint is very, very, very different because no longer are they just simply representing themselves. They're representing all those who cast their vote for them. And so when they step in there, they exercise a very broad and expanded influence in that environment. Now I want you to think of yourself. You've been selected and elected by God. He's put his vote in you. So no longer are you just that little person that you think, well, I can't really make much of an impact, not on my society or my culture, maybe in my home environment. Oh, do not limit yourself. Don't define yourself based only on yourself. Realize the vote that's in you. You are chosen, selected, and elected by Almighty God. He's put his vote in you, and his presence is in you. And now where you go, you have the power to influence others. It is broad. It is expansive. It is intense. When you are cognizant of that reality, you you realize not arrogantly, not egotistically, but when you step into an environment or into a room or into a place, you realize you're not just representing yourself, you are representing God Almighty and the King of Kings that resides within you. Do you realize the impact that you can have in your profession? When you step into that business place or that medical center or you step out onto the street, God is using you in a strong and a significant and a powerful way. But you have to believe that. I remember Oral Roberts, when I attended their undergrad and graduate school, Oral Roberts University, he was alive at the time. And once in a while, he'd come out to the students and he didn't say anything really all that profound. But I'll never forget this simple truth he communicated to all of us. It is indelibly put in my head and in my heart. He came out one chapel and he said, listen, God has voted for you, put his big thumb up, and the devil has voted against you, but your vote determines the results. Your vote determines the election. You can vote here or you can vote with God. And when he said that, I'll tell you, it stirred something in me to say, God, you have voted thumbs up for me. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. You gave your very best to me. I'm going to give my very best to you. Thumbs up. I'm connected to you. I want to see this world impacted by your presence in my life. I hope that is your desire, your aspiration, your dream, your hope. I hope it sets the very path and direction of your life, that you want to be one with God and allow his will and his kingdom to come and manifest through you. You are a chosen generation, elected not by the American population, no, you've been selected and elected by God. His vote is behind you. Believe that deep in your heart. You're a royal priesthood. Royalty. That's the bloodline. That's what is to course through your veins and your arteries, realizing that you are connected to Jesus Christ, that the promise in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you've become a new creation 
and that there's a new bloodline that's flowing through you. You're not defined the way psychologists, sociologists, and those who study human behavior would describe you. They'd say, well, you're limited by your genetic makeup, your environment, your education, your, your accumulation of experiences, by your nationality, your ethnicity. No, you're not. You're more than all of that. You're not limited or defined by any of those things, be it your experience, education, nationality, ethnicity, doesn't matter, not even your past. You are defined by a new bloodline that courses through your veins in your life. And you have to know that and believe it. Otherwise, you're just going to sit there depressed and say, listen, I'm only doing what my dad did and my mom did, and this is just part of the genetic makeup of who I am. Stop it! Realize there's power in the blood of Jesus and his life has transformed you. You are a royal priesthood. You're connected to God. Remember what a priest does. He represents God to man and man to God. And your role there has to be filled with the presence of Jesus. You're a holy nation. It means you are whole and made complete, fused together by God Almighty. See, I don't think, look at holiness as legalism, do's and don'ts. I think of it as the opportunity for me to be made whole. It's analogous to that. When God makes you holy, he puts you together correctly. Where you're discombobulated, convoluted, and dispersed in a myriad of different directions, God puts you together. You know, in, in nuclear science, there's both fission and fusion makes up the nuclear expression of bombs. The fission is when they split things up. It releases a substantial amount of energy. We know it to be the atomic bomb. Fission, it's like the devil. He divides, he separates, it's exactly what sin does, it splits you up. And there's energy that's released, it has a very negative impact on others. When you choose to sin and be cut all up, there's a, a fission that occurs in your life and dangerous energy that's released from you. But on the other side, there's fusion, a, a coming together. Do you know it's three to four times stronger, the energy that's released from fusion, nuclear fusion, than fission? And when you come together and it's made whole, oh, there's an explosion, but I say this in a positive way, from your life an energy that comes from your holiness from God. That's why it says a holy nation. Not just, it doesn't just have an impact on a small environment. The whole nation can be impacted by the presence of God's holiness residing within you. And you're a special people. This is a very hard portion of scripture to be interpreted. The particular Greek word is, was a hard one for scholars to wrestle it down because it's, had, it's so diversified in its interpretation. That's why some translations will say, well, you're a special people or you're a peculiar people, you're a unique people, not sure how to handle it. The raw interpretation of the word has some negative connotations, but it's exactly what it says. You are owned, possessed, a property of God. Now, at first that sounds like, wow, I lose my identity. No, you gain your identity. It's not a loss of identity. You now align your identity with him. It's not a loss of will. Now you align your will with him. You are owned by God, possessed by God. And I think, you know, when you think of possession, you think of something in the context of demonology and demons. I want you to put the most positive connotation you can on this. God owns your life. You belong to him. You are his property, his possession. And I want you to think of how you respond to something that you own or possess, that you define as your property. You'll protect it. Is it your car, your boat, your house? Let's get more personal. Maybe it's your son or your daughter, your grandson, granddaughter. You want to meet a fierce woman that could take on about 20 guys? You try to touch her children. I'll tell you, she'll come out, I'll tear you all apart. You'll see some women get militant because that's their possession. They're protecting. Think of it with the Lord. I think of it. I'm your special people. We are his special people. You own my life. You own our life. We're your property. We're your possession. We belong to you. 
You're gonna use me, not abuse me. You're gonna hold me and not crush me. And you're gonna protect my life. Wow. Kingdom people, not to become arrogant, but to become bold and vigilant, devoted and dedicated to that reality. Another choice that I try to make each day in relationship to this pattern is give us day by day our daily bread. I choose to receive all of the provision that God has for me today. What is it that we need? Not to do our will, but his will. I believe, again, with a whole heart, not with being cocky, but confidence, that I'm gonna have everything today that I need to do his will, not Gary's will, his will. I'm gonna have all the time, all the energy, all the wisdom, all the strength, all the passion, all the intellect, all the finance, all the health that I need to do his will. So when I lift that, I say, Lord, I choose to receive your full provision for me today. You know what I'm going to contend with. You know what I'm going to struggle with. You know what I'm going to battle, what I'm going to face. You know the wisdom and the discernment that I'm going to need. You know the moral and ethical strength that I'm going to need. Please provide that. You know the time that I'm going to need. You know the passion and the fire that I'm going to need to deal with this issue. What is it in your life? When again, remember what preceded it, a focus on the will of God and the kingdom of God, his will, his kingdom. Now we say, grant me all the provision I need to do your will, to advance your kingdom. What is it in your life? I mentioned a few for me. In the morning, I'll say, Lord, I need moral strength. I know I'm going to confront a lot of temptations in that arena. I need ethical strength. I know I'm going to confront some things where maybe just to protect my own identity, I would have a tendency to want to uh, skew off course from really telling reality or the truth. I want to, I need ethical strength to say things as they really are without being distorted with reality. I need wisdom. This is more than intelligence. I had some professors that had three or four PhDs. I marveled at their cerebral region, their intellect, their academic uh, abilities. But I was um, a little bit personally embarrassed by their lack of wisdom because wisdom is knowing how to take that knowledge and apply it. Ask the Lord, give me wisdom. I want more than knowledge. I want wisdom and discernment. I need soundness and boldness today. I need good health and finances. I need peace, a stability, and a love, a security. I, I need godly authority and power to contend with demonic forces and darkness. What is it that you need? Ask him for that and make the choice to say, I'm going to receive the provision of that fully and completely in my life. And then this is the last choice I want to zero in on. Maybe it's one of the most difficult but it's at the beginning of my day, at the inception of my day, based on the pattern of the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, that I know I have to make a choice to receive his forgiveness, to really receive it, and then to release it unto others. It's a daily decision because all of us are undergoing sanctification, refinement. There's mistakes in our life. You want to fail forward. You want to learn from the mistake that you've made. Or you may have had a moral failing or a sin. And you have to come before God and say, Lord, I ask you to please forgive me. And I want to receive your forgiveness. Now, when we do that, let me describe it by this illustration. This is based on 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Very important portion of scripture for me at the beginning of my day. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. Sometimes we don't get both. We just receive the forgiveness, but we forget to receive the cleansing. What can happen is we have in our life some bondage, some sin, and it weighs heavy upon us. And so we come before the Lord and say, listen, I compromised, I made a wrong decision, I sinned. Maybe it was with envy or jealousy or bigotry. Maybe it was cheating or lying or maybe it was with lust or some area of stealing or gossip, whatever it might be, or greed. You say, Lord, I've sinned against you. I make confession. That means to come into agreement with what he says and his standards. I make confession and I ask you to forgive me. When he forgives, there is a release the actual word in the Greek language for forgive means to release. But there's a problem that sometimes we do. We still come under condemnation. We can't seem to forget it. 
and there's the bondage is gone, but there's a rope of captivity that stays with us. And as we go into the day, as we take our walk through the day, it not only impacts or impedes our ability to move forward, it slows us down, paralyzes us, and we can even run it into others and it can impact them because there hasn't been a cleansing. And oh, we might say, well, you know, condemnation, guilt, I guess it's a good thing because it allows me that kind of that catharsis of beating myself up. I blew it. And I thought I was solid in the Lord and I blew it. So the condemnation we think is uh, somehow beneficial, something heroic because like, I'm so bad, I'm so disappointed with me. But condemnation is extremely dangerous. You know why? It keeps you connected to the sin. And that's why sometimes this happens. The rope of captivity, of condemnation, we just pull it back in and we find ourselves committing the same sin again. The path that got us there is the connection that came from condemnation. That's why it's so important not only to be released, Lord, I receive your forgiveness. That's release. I receive your cleansing. The word in the Greek means actually removal, the removal of the condemnation. Romans 8, 1 and 2, I marry that to 1 John 1, 9. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has set me free from the law of sin and death. Then I can move on and the condemnation that sometimes keeps me connected and pulls the sin back in and it becomes then a consistent habitual sin in my life is because I haven't dealt with that issue of condemnation. What a difference when you say, Lord, I receive from you forgiveness, release. I receive from you cleansing, removal. And that deliverance comes over your life. Now, what about forgiving others? Jesus says this. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Boy, that sounds harsh at first. It sounds like a big question mark you put over the unconditional love of God and his character when it comes to the issue of his forgiveness. Maybe the better lens to look at this is to understand this. When you and I don't forgive, it cuts off our ability to receive forgiveness. The hand, by analogy, to receive God's forgiveness is severed or cut off because we haven't released forgiveness to another. So it's, the problem isn't with God's character or his willingness to forgive us. The problem is our ability to receive it because our hand has been severed because we've maintained an unforgiving heart and spirit towards someone. Now, I will not dilute the word of Jesus. He gives us a sober warning. If you don't forgive, you won't receive it. So that reality is there, but I look at it again through the lens of realizing what I've done is I've jeopardized my ability to receive his forgiveness because I haven't released it. I've, I've allowed my hand to be severed or cut off, or maybe for some you might think of it in terms of a chain wrapping up your hand. You know, when you're unforgiving towards someone, it doesn't necessarily bind them all up. They may go on their merry way, but you're all bound up, and your hand is so filled with the chain of unforgiveness, you can't receive and you have to ask the Lord, Lord, I need to release this chain. And you might say it's very, very difficult. There was a gentleman many years ago in our church. I knew him personally. I knew him well. He was in leadership. His precious daughter and granddaughter were both murdered by two individuals. It was a horrific day, horrific week, a horrific month and year in his life and all of our lives. I went to the funeral to see both caskets and those two laying there was horrible. This precious father, when he was in the courtroom, the two individuals that they did apprehend who were sentenced to serve for the murder of his daughter and granddaughter, they laughed as they left the courtroom. He said, Pastor, there was no way I could forgive them. No way. Now, he gave testimony of this, that after a year or two, he was driving to the prison to bring money to some individuals that were gonna hurt those two really bad. And as he was driving there, the Lord spoke this verse to him. That I give you there is one of the things I do, bring to mind what God did for you. Forgiving 
even as God in Christ forgave you. He said, Pastor, I was in the car. I said, I can't. I can't. They took my daughter and my granddaughter, and they laughed. I want to hurt them so bad. And then he did the second thing. He said, but God, give me a grace that goes beyond my own to release this chain, to release my forgiveness on them. He said, Pastor, I was in my car. I pulled over, and I couldn't stop crying for hours as I did what was for me an absolute miracle. I released them. I forgave them. And then I felt the presence of God come over my life, changing me and strengthening me like no one else could. I did what I could never do in my own strength, but I did it by the grace of God. Now, I don't know where you're at. I knew him, still know him. It's a true story. What God did in his life, he can do in your life. Bring to mind what God did for you. Ask God for grace to empower you to forgive. And then pray for the one you need to forgive. He said he did that too. He started to pray and intercede. Could you imagine that? Anyone in here have a son, a daughter, grandson, granddaughter? So beyond ability and our own strength. He began to pray for them. Pray for those who have hurt you. And then depart from the offense. Don't let it bite you again. There's something of that imagery of if you go back to it. See, some of us think, well, isn't it there supposed to be the forgiving and forgetting? Biblical forgetting is understood through Deuteronomy and in the chapter 8 and verse 11. It's not a loss of memory. How could he possibly forget that? Okay? It's not a loss of memory. It's a loss of being controlled and influenced by the memory anymore. And so when we say, I release my forgiveness, I let go, and I'm not going to revisit it, I'm going to, in one sense, biblically forget it. Not a loss of memory, but a loss of being controlled by that anymore. Then there's a victory that comes over your life, and you never get bit by it again. A picture that's given to us in Galatians 5.15, it says, don't bite and devour one another. The imagery is like cannibalism. It's horrible, but the apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chooses to use it. It says, don't, don't, with your bitterness and your unforgiveness, bite and devour and consume one another. But release in a spirit of love and forgiveness. And now I pray this blessing on your life. Do know at the end, if you've come and you've never received Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, to receive the gift of purpose and the gift of eternal life and the gift of forgiveness, I encourage you to come forward because it's all found in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're battling with something in your physical body. God has a provision of healing for you. Maybe it's a relationship that's gone south or sour and you need help desperately. I encourage you, come and meet one of the leaders and receive prayer. And now I pray this blessing, this benediction upon you, that God's abundant grace would flood and fill your life, empowering you to do what you could never do in your own strength that God's grace would be abounding in you and manifesting through you. I pray this blessing in Jesus' name. Would you say, I receive that? So let it be. God bless you. Give a hug to that person next to you.